Welcome to Keep Smiling, the e-commerce customer experience podcast. Selling products online is challenging and can lead to poor customer experiences. Each episode, we explore how entrepreneurs and organizations in e-commerce are delivering delightfully unexpected experiences to their shoppers and customers. Amazon, Shopify, artificial intelligence, we'll discuss what matters today and what you can do to build a better e-commerce business. We'll show you how. Hello, listeners, and thank you again for being here with us. I'm your host, Ty Walters, and joining me is my co-host, Michael Melgar. Hello, everyone. Today, our featured guest is Matthew Patterson of Help Scout. Welcome, Matthew, and thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for having me. Today is the first show in a new format. We're doing a customer experience spotlight series where we'll be getting to know what some of the best companies in the world are doing to create excellent customer experiences. We'll try to examine today at least three levels of experience. The customer experience that Help Scout creates for its users, the customer experience that Help Scout users are able to create for their customers, and then third, probably the lesser uh, explored area of experience would be the experience that Help Scout creates for its team. So it's workers and employees, and Matt is a team member of Help Scout. So we're going to get into that and his experience there. Matthew currently lives outside of Sydney, Australia, with three kids, one wife, and two chickens. I'm envious, Matt. I wish I had some chickens here. I don't even have a yard. What's their names, Matt? Uh, I believe, and you would have to check with the children on this, but I believe they're called Lee and Peeper. Ah, that's great. Matthew is part of the marketing team at Help Scout. He writes, he talks, he hosts webinars where I was first introduced to Matt, and sometimes dorky videos about helping people deliver better customer service. Matt, for that reason, you fit right in with us at Seller Smile. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the ball. Fun fact about Matt is he once walked into a wave full of stinging jellyfish in Australia. Oh my God. That sounds like my worst nightmare, Matt. <laughs> I would not recommend it. How bad was it? Uh, it was not great. I lived at that time, I lived at right across from this beach uh, in Cronulla in Sydney. And I went from my house, I went across the road, like I jogged across. It was a real hot day. I thought I'd get in the water. I went in the water. The very first wave that hit me was full of jellyfish. And I came out and they were literally wrapped around my torso and my neck and my legs. Oh, no. And I had to <laughs> peel them all off one by one. Uh, and then I went immediately home and in the hot shower. And yeah. Well, we're glad you're here. <laughs> are, are you a surfer or uh, just a swimmer? Uh, no, I've tried surfing. I do not have the uh, balance for it, but I enjoy swimming in the ocean. It's funny you said that too, because this past week I was at the beach with my family and uh, I've never seen a shark before in my life, like not out in the ocean. And there was right behind my girlfriend, about four or five feet behind her in a wave that was about to crash. I see the shadow of a shark that's maybe about four feet long. It scared me so much. I ran out of that water. Yeah. Yeah. I've... Uh... I haven't seen many sharks in Australia, despite what you might think from everything I hear from American people generally. But uh, I can see from my office where I am right now, I can see the ocean and I can sometimes see whales out there. And I think that's wow. a much nicer way to do it. We might have to get a picture of that to share with our users. That sounds yeah, awesome. That sounds beautiful. Absolutely. Matt, a quick introduction on Help Scout. We're users of Help Scout. They're a software tool, serves primarily as a customer messaging platform for small and medium businesses, which includes email, live chat, a self-serve knowledge base, and embedded messaging, which I think is one of your newer features. Help Scout offers integrations with Shopify, MailChimp, and many other different platforms. So we're here to talk about Help Scout today and Matt, but Michael, you had a story to share about Help Scout. Yeah. I just wanted to quickly chime in with just, I guess, how much of a fan I am of Help Scout. And we, we by no means mean this episode to come off as an advertisement at all. It's just we, we truly believe in the services that Help Scout provides and kind of the way they're going about it. Uh, not too long ago, we were forced to pick a new ticketing system for all of our clients. We were previously using Salesforce Desk. And they were actually announced that they were sunsetting their service. So we began this whole exploration of all these top ticketing system contenders, Zendesk, um, uh, Salesforce had their own service cloud. There was like Freshdesk, all these different uh, services. And 
after a lot of thorough research, perhaps too much research, we just ended up deciding on Help Scout. And it was just a clear winner by far in our book. And um, some of the reasons for that, you know, there's excellent help from their customer service. Anytime that we had a question or I was curious about something that we could possibly do with Help Scout, their team would respond to us within the day. And usually they would anticipate questions that I had in the future and let me know, like, go ahead and proactively talk to me about things that they knew I was going to have a question about. Another really cool thing is whenever you are going through cases, they present you with this sort of celebration when you're closing all of your cases out. And I love this, Matt, whoever's idea it was at Help Scout, you guys should give them a huge pat in the back. For example, whenever you have closed all of your cases in an inbox, you might get a message that says something like party time. You did it. Celebrate responsibly. And you get a nice little nice little icon to celebrate with you. But besides that, you know, there's the rule setup is so important for us because there's so many ways that we want to customize the way that we use our internal inboxes. But the way that Help Scout allows you to set up your rules, your automation is so easy. It's so simple and by far the easiest setup that we had on any of those systems. So props to Help Scout for that. And then finally, Beacon. We love Beacon. Beacon is this chat widget that Help Scout uh, allows you to install on your website. Huge fan. We're still working with it. You know, it includes a knowledge base system and includes a chat system and email all in one. And it just kind of sits on your website. So lots of awesome things. I have nothing but praise for Help Scout. Matthew, let's start off by talking more about you and your past as it pertains to customer service and customer experience. Whenever Michael and I are on a call uh, on a webinar or a company that we're collaborating with, we always give a brief introduction about the work that we've done and and customer service. But tell us a little bit more about your past and your history and maybe some of your earlier experiences leading up to what you do today with Help Scout. Yeah, sure. I was um, thinking about this ahead of time like what what is my background in customer service and i think it goes all the way back to my very very first job uh which was you know one sunday every few weeks as a paper boy i didn't even have a bike um that i could use i had to drag this cart around by hand and uh tough work it was pretty flat at least the area i lived in it wasn't too bad not where i where i live now i would have died but i was thinking about what did i learn from that job and i would get paid per newspaper i sold right so I knew there are certain houses where I like, I know there's someone in there who likes to buy the paper every Sunday. And so I kind of learned like if they haven't shown up, I'll just stand in front of their house for an extra minute blowing the whistle super loud uh, <laughs> until they come out, which uh, when I think about it now is it's sort of like uh, retargeted advertising, right? Like I know you're in there. <laughs> I know you're interested in this product that I have to sell. So come on out. So that was my first job. Uh, I went through university. I did my IT degree. Uh, and while I was working there, I worked retail at a store called Big W, which is sort of like a, a variant of Walmart almost in Australia. Uh, so I worked oh. on the checkouts there, did that kind of thing. And, you know, you deal with real people who are very stressed, especially around Christmas time at a store like that. Oh, yeah. I, I come from a yeah. retail background as well, Matt, and I, I definitely know what you mean. There's something about that that kind of just prepares you for the craziness that the customer service world entails. Yeah. And you, and you realize doing online support is not so bad because people can't get right up in your face and scream at you and how, how you should be fired for losing their uh, their doll that they put on lay-by six months ago. Exactly. There's something much more visceral and intense about in-person interactions. We talk a little bit about in previous episodes, the difference between brick and mortar customer service versus e-commerce or online customer service. And I think Michael and I are happy to have that digital separation because sometimes the intensity that dissatisfied customers bring is overwhelming and it, it can be overly stressful. So anything to cope with that helps customer service staff, I think, deal better. That degree of separation it can cause problems. And maybe we'll get into this too. Like it can be hard to be have that human interaction digitally, but it also gives you that, that time and the capacity to just take a breath and think, I know this person's upset, but how can I help them? But so yeah, during my university years, that's what I did. Uh, And then my first job was kind of in tech support too, after university, where I was providing uh, like help desk work for uh, a company, uh, allegedly a software product. It was really a collection of like word macros and Excel spreadsheets and things. It was pretty horrendous. (laughs) Uh, so I worked there for a little while and then I transitioned into web design and I did that for many years in Australia and the UK. Uh, and then 
came back to join a little software company, or it was very little at the time, called Campaign Monitor. Not little at all now. I joined, it was two founders and one developer when I joined. And uh, I was their first customer service person. And I kind of switched out of web design to do that. And I stayed there for nine years. And by the time I left, I had 27 people all over the world and in my support team as part of that. And I wrote a book while I was there about HTML email, one of the more exciting books that you'll ever read. And uh, so that's where I really all this customer service experience has come from. And, and then the last few years, I've been at Help Scout, where I'm uh, more on the marketing side, really talking about customer service and trying to share some of those experiences with everybody. And that's how I got to where I am. Thank you so much, Matthew, for sharing that. I'm even getting a better understanding now of where you're at and where you've come from. Listening to you tell your story, it seems very similar to both of ours, but especially Michael's. He was sort of the first customer service director at a software company as well. And he built up a team over the, maybe it was five years at that position. I'd be interested to hear more about that. What was your experience building that initial customer service team? Talk to us about what it was like at the beginning and then when it was at its maximum size of 27 people, because that sounds like that sounds overwhelming, almost like herding cats. Was it as difficult as it sounds? Um, I think it was. It was definitely challenging for me uh, when I started. Well, I think there is a benefit to being the first person, and maybe, Michael, you might agree with this, but when there is no one else to answer the question except for you, you just have to do it, and you develop a whole bunch of skills because you can't kind of cherry pick your way through the day. You know you're going to have to, there's a question there, I'm going to have to get to it somehow. So you're kind of forced into being able to deal with all sorts of uncomfortable situations. 100%. I agree. That is definitely a skill that I'm very thankful for today. And so, yeah, I picked up a lot of that, but then there is a shift from like when there's a couple of people and I hired two or three people. And at first I could hire people who were just like me, like even to the degree that they were sometimes former web designers who were transitioning into customer service because I knew this is a skill set that I have. And if I can replicate that, they can do what I can do. And they could. One of the big challenges I had was then getting beyond that point to five, six, seven people. You can't always find exactly the same people and it doesn't make sense. I wanted different sets of skills available to me and people who had more of a service background than I did really, or who came in with just, you know, just a more diverse set of people. And one of the early challenges that I faced, I think, was figuring out how different they could be and still come in and do the job that they needed to do. And I kind of made a couple of mistakes there. This is another talk that I've done in the past about uh, dumb mistakes in my past, but hiring people who didn't have uh, necessarily like enough technical background to be able to do that part of the work and just made the job really hard for them and really hard for me and the rest of the team uh, and um, kind of took a long time to work through these things. So yeah, I was there for such a long time that I think we managed to work our way through uh, and started to get better at putting in place, you know, what do I need to train people on? What are the kind of attitudes that they need to have really, that it's really hard to give somebody that kind of attitude. You sort of need to find it rather than create it. Yeah. And then as I grew bigger and bigger, then the, the job is just very different. When you've got 20 people to look after, you can't be worrying about individual conversations in the queue anymore. You have to worry about how can I make these 20 people, you know, better at their jobs and succeed in their careers. There's absolutely a science to the hiring and the training aspect. I really resonate with a lot of what you said because I had the exact same experience in that, you know, when I first started, you know, the, I guess like my skill set kind of felt like a generalist, right? I was good at a lot of different things, you know, perhaps some of the more technical aspects or perhaps some of the more service-based aspects. And so some of our first hires had similar mindsets or similar skill sets. And then once it got beyond a certain point, you do like you have to start hiring specialists, people who might have perhaps a more of a strength in writing good response templates or building out our knowledge base or perhaps even kind of doing like client account management sort of thing. So I definitely understand what you mean by that. And there's so many complex aspects to growing a customer service team, especially like our audience. I feel might be right at the brink of starting on some of that. And so it's definitely interesting insights. We'll recommend them to check out some of your previous posts. Awesome. I think Michael and I have understood there's a preconceived notion that a support team is sort of this army of drones that are all working at the same rate to solve tickets. But when in reality, you're dealing with 
a diversity of different skill sets that your agents are bringing to the table. And you want some of that differentiation. Like Michael said, you're going to have people that are pioneering, creating your knowledge bases and revising your articles. Maybe they're really strong in grammar. Others are really solid on the phone. They can have phone conversations all day. Others would prefer to never talk, but they can type a message all day. So part of the skill that I'm sure both of you have is being sensitive to that and understanding where to put people when they're not working out in a certain position. Yeah, definitely. I think I wrote this article once about uh, the five people you meet and support. Like, I think to have a tendency to think everybody should be like the A player who crushes the queue, right? who gets through a million tickets every day. But even if you could do that, it just wouldn't be a great team. You just need other things as you grow and you need someone who's really good at troubleshooting complex issues and the person who's really good at dealing with the, the most upset customers. And it's rare. It's very rare to find someone who can do all of those things at the highest level. But you can definitely find people who can do a great job and then who can be really good in one area. And as you grow, that's what you need. Right. And so we're talking about customer service, managing a team that's interacting with customers on behalf of their client. A buzzword in the industry today is customer experience. This is a word that's used to describe sort of the overall holistic experience that a shopper or a customer has with the company, which oftentimes includes their interaction with the customer service team. We asked Matt about his opinion on what he thought created a good customer experience today. Matt, can you explain that in your own words when you hear that word? What comes to mind and how should companies be thinking about customer experience? Yeah, I think you nailed it there. The customer experience is a very broad term. It's everything to do with that interactions that you have with a company at all the different touch points. So everything from like the first time you see their ad, their banner ad or whatever pop up, like that's part of the experience. And so is browsing the marketing site and signing up for their email newsletter and contacting sales or support and getting things marketed to you. All of that counts as customer experience. And so there is no one definition. Like you couldn't say, what is a good customer experience? Because it's going to be different for people, even people with the exact same problem. What is a good experience for them is going to be different depending on who those people are. Even the same person who's in a, just in a different context, what they would consider a good experience is going to differ from day to day. But I think we can kind of draw out some characteristics of a good experience that are consistent across all of those different channels. Right? And so the ones that come to mind for me would be timeliness, the ability to get what I need from this company at the time when I need it uh, and not be forced onto their timeline or waiting really long time. That pretty much always matters. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be fast all the time because sometimes timeliness just means I don't need to know today. I just need to know in the next week, right? That's when it matters to me. Accuracy, and this is more of a support one, but sometimes you can get a really fast, really friendly, really helpful answer that's not accurate. Uh, sometimes, uh, I will say, in my experience, I have sent a really good, helpful, but wrong answer, and that sucks for everybody. Honesty. Honesty, I think, again, applies across the entire customer experience, especially often there is a disconnect between the way something is marketed and the way that it's sold and the way that it is supported. And these things don't always line up in the way that the product is described. So honesty across all areas, taking responsibility for mistakes, not from a design perspective, not kind of tricking people into signing up for things that they didn't want or paying more for something they don't need to pay more for. I think that is an element of a good experience. Effort uh, and obviously low effort for the customer. So the company taking on as much of the labor of getting stuff done that they can. So don't make me switch channels to get help from you. When I go to the website, don't make it like really hard to contact you if I need help. Um, don't make me repeat myself over and over again. So reducing effort. And then the last one I would say is um, consistency. So not just consistently good service, but consistency between what is marketed to the customer, what the sales team is describing the product is, how the social media voice of the company sounds compared to how the sales sounds, compared to how the marketing sounds. So that it all feels like where, whichever part of that journey, whichever part of that experience you're in with that company, it sounds like it's the same company and they have the same values and they think about things in the same way. I think those are the five for me. And I'm not a big fan of some of the language that gets thrown around in the customer experience world of like, it's all about wow moments and, you know, Zappos getting on the phone for 11 hours with a person. Like this is all, I think, 
it's good PR, but it's not really uh, about customer experience, uh, especially probably for the 20 people who are stuck waiting for their call to be answered while that person's on the phone for 11 hours. It's what, Matt, it makes me think about, I want to say you, it was a blog post that you might have written where it was like, this is the most boring email you'll read all week or something like that. And it was just kind of like recounting some of what makes really good customer service, maybe like like uh, some of the more recent examples that happened that you were aware of and how they're not necessarily exciting, but they touch on these characteristics of a great experience. Yeah, exactly. I think it was, uh, yeah, the five most boring customer service stories that I could find. That's it. I'm, I would always personally go for like solid and consistent and reliable experience. It's uh, rather than when I contact this company, am I going to get the good person or am I going to get the bad person right. or am I going to have this amazing experience or is it going to be one of the times where they just don't answer? We see that in our industry as well in e-commerce. It's that sometimes the best experience is when you don't even have an interaction and everything just works. Uh, Matthew, I just wanted to highlight something that you said about honesty. You said sometimes there's a difference between how products are marketed, sold, and supported. I think Michael and I definitely see that in our line of work. We're dealing with usually a small team that owns and manages a brand of physical products. And the information that they include in their marketing materials on their product detail page sometimes does not line up with their intended customer service policies. This typically is a point of friction that results in some sort of interaction. There's a customer service ticket, confusion, something gets escalated, and that puts our team in a difficult position. I think often we find ourselves negotiating with the business owner, urging them to put everything in alignment to make sure that what they're saying is honest up front, because that's going to reduce the number of interactions, creating much less problems through that customer experience journey ultimately leading to customers not even having to contact you because everything makes sense. There's consistency and they're able to purchase your products without any confusion. You can can see the temptation. Like if we just tweak this wording a little bit, it makes it just sound like something people sign up more quickly than they would if we tried to explain the whole thing to them. Uh, And so you can see how it happens. And sometimes it's it's completely well-intentioned. Like, no, we wrote it in this way, but we intended it to mean this particular thing. But customers are reading it differently. And that's the support people who end up having to deal with that disconnect between what they think they're getting and what they are getting. And yeah, it's no fun for anybody. I think it can be a problem that's hidden from a company sometimes, especially if there is a separate support team, because they can kind of take the brunt of it and do the explanation and leave that customer not terribly satisfied, but that information doesn't always get back into the company. So it sounds like you're doing the right thing though, of taking that back up to the company owners and saying, look, here is where people are getting confused and what can we do about it? And it helps increase confidence in your buyers as well. We use the term buyers a lot. In Help Scout's world, it would be like users. But when you're honest about something, they might not necessarily be happy with perhaps like this isn't the exact resolution they wanted, but you don't have to be unrealistic about it. You're being very upfront and honest and transparent about what you can actually do. And in our experience, that makes the person come back and usually they're less upset about a really, you know, really complex or really difficult scenario. Right. It's always better to be transparent up front. Matt, let's transition now. We got your idea about what you think good experience is, how you think about that in terms of how Help Scout does business and, and your past, certainly. Michael talked a little bit about aspects of Help Scout that drew us in when we were looking for a new solution. And one of those was the helpfulness. We had a question, you know, are we going to be able to do this or, or make this integration work? We'd go to your website, hop on a chat, and in a couple seconds, we'd be talking with a support agent giving us that answer. That's one example, but talk to us a little bit about how Help Scout allows their clients to do this for their customers. Seller Smile is a great example. We use Help Scout to contact buyers on Amazon, buyers from e commerce stores. We're providing good experiences to them. What allows Help Scout to do that for its clients? Yeah. So one of the key things, and you mentioned it before, is helpfulness is really important. It's one of our core values. And so I think the kind of the big picture answer of like, how do we create good experiences for our clients is it's all about creating the environment for the team in which to do that. 
Uh, so that helpfulness is really important, and we use that as a, a kind of a tool for prioritizing and making decisions, right? We're, we're going to invest time and effort into things, and a lot of the things that we invest time and effort into are helpful to our kind of come up customers and non-customers, but they're not necessarily like directly revenue-making things, and that's because we value that helpfulness as part of this is what Help Scout is. Um, keeping the team really close to the customers, so... You know, we're a team of probably close to 100 people now. Um, everybody does some support, either a couple of hours a week or one day a month. So everybody is talking to customers directly, no matter what your role is in the company. That's super helpful and super important. Also means that when we go on company retreats, the, uh, the poor support team doesn't have to do all the work because everybody has some capacity to help. Matt, that's awesome. I, I just wanted to kind of make a quick mention of this. In our some of our previous experiences, or even in my last job right before Seller Smile, all the product managers who were a part of the product team got their start from customer service, from the customer service team. And that allowed them, kind of what you mentioned earlier, the, the prioritization, right? It really allowed them to truly understand what people were having trouble with and act as a, an ambassador or an advocate for customers, like to truly actually make things better, valuable and worth the time. Yeah, that's one of the real benefits of um, making customer service like a valuable career option for people is that you can do that. You can kind of spread customer service people into other parts of the organization. And it's a kind of a shortcut to getting that customer centric focus across the business. I think that makes a huge difference. So that's definitely one of the ways we do it. One of the benefits we have obviously at Help Scout is that we use Help Scout to support our customers too. So we know uh, we really feel what it's like to use that product every day to do the job that we expect our customers to do for their customers. So, you know, dog fooding, or if you prefer drinking your own champagne, either way. And uh, I mentioned those retreats. Another thing that we've done at the company retreats where everyone gets together because we're fully remote, um, we've had a couple of times where part of the retreat is we just get a customer up on a big screen, like a, a live Zoom call, and have this customer talk to us about like, this is how I use it in my business to do what I want to do. Because of course, we're all focused on what Help Scout is and how we're doing Help Scout. But our customers, Help Scout is just a tool that they're using to do something else. And it's just really important for us to hear from them about what that is that they're trying to do. Uh, so that's another way to do it. And then I think it's about choosing the right customers. Like it's really hard to provide really good experiences for everybody in the world. Because like I talked about before, what is a good experience varies so much from person to person. But then when you're talking about how you're going to try to sell to enterprise customers as well as to, you know, a two, three person company, they just probably want very different things. And part of success is to identify who are the people that we can really, really help and how do we find those people and just go deeper with them. Uh, so I think that's an important factor for Help Scout. Yeah, and then we just go back to uh, implementing it. So you have got to have staff who are trained and shown this is what we mean by how we treat our customers and get good mentoring. One of the things that I used to tell my support team at Campaign Monitor all the time, uh, which is definitely true here too, is that part of the reason we can do really good customer service is we have a really good product. Uh, and like it doesn't, if, if you could take the world's best customer service team and make them support a really bad product, it's still going to suck for the customers no matter how good they are. Uh, because ultimately it's the, the product that they're trying to use. So that that alignment between the product being built to do the sort of support that we think is good customer service uh, and then the rest of the team being around there and understanding the job that the customer are trying to get done, that all comes together to create pretty consistently good experiences. Thank you for saying that, Matt. We see that in e-commerce as well. It's much easier to provide excellent customer service for a company whose product is popular, flying off the shelves, works right every time. It's such a different position to be in sort of this um, urgent putting out fire stage where there's defects happening and misuse of the product or misunderstandings going on. I know we see a range of it with the clients that we work with, and it's always a pleasure to deal with the former, and which is why we spend so much time in more of a consulting type of position because we're trying to get them to connect the dots to see the connection between a five-star product review and a good product. A lot of times I think that's missed on e-commerce sellers. 
Well, and it's part of what you've touched on, Matt, where some of the interactions that your customer service team is is receiving every single day, that information can come back and be a part of what makes the future of your product better. It's almost like the quality of the product and service is only improved by using excellent customer service and really listening to what people are saying. That's right. It's a and service is like an it's an addition to that good product, that good service. It's not a replacement for it. Uh, they they both need to be there for it to work. Um, and I was just thinking about like what are the practical things in terms of like how do we at HelpScout how do we create excellent experiences? So I, th- I think something that speaks to that maybe is I just remember a couple of cases where like the design team is rolling out some changes and we just hear some feedback like the particular link color that's chosen here. Uh, you know, there are some accessibility issues for certain people uh, and it's hard. It's a sort of thing. It's hard to test, but we heard from a few customers and I just appreciate working at a place where the design team takes that feedback and says, OK, yep, well, I see what's happening. We're going to make a tweak. We're going to improve that. We'll roll it out and it just gets done. And the same for product changes more generally, which is not to say you don't have to do everything your customers ask for, but being willing to listen and hear what people are saying is a really key element to good customer experiences. Because if you're not listening, you're just never going to be able to deliver consistently good experiences. We talked about this on one of our recent episodes where we're gaining actionable insights from your customer service, but there's like lots of large companies that literally pay thousands of dollars in like market research to try to get people's opinions on how they feel about their product or their service. And especially in e-commerce, even in my time in the software world, people are telling you exactly how they feel, right? And, and of course, you have to be mindful of the squeaky wheel, but with things like Amazon product reviews and, and uh, kind of just some of the patterns you see emerge there, it's definitely putting everyday e-commerce sellers in a position where they have access to this feedback. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think of uh, sometimes large companies, especially, they treat their customer facing teams as sort of like, uh, I think of Game of Thrones and the wall, you know, like they have their support people up on this giant wall and their job is to prevent any customers from getting inside the wall and annoying the rest of the company. And so they're they're just bouncing off all that great feedback is coming right to them and it's getting thrown back out again, or it's just, it's, it's hitting those support people and it stays there because there's no channel, there's no system for them to capture that information and pass it on in a useful way. That's a beautiful metaphor. It's a lost opportunity if you're not channeling that feedback. I had this experience working under Michael on his customer service team. We learned so much about the software tools that we were supporting. Sometimes we had an even deeper, more holistic perspective than the developers themselves who had, who were building on the product. And not only that, but we got the human emotional aspect of it because we saw repeatedly the frustrations that were associated with a certain bug or a certain feature or lack thereof. So I love this model of having everyone in Help Scout on the front lines in some capacity. I think it makes the feedback, it turns it from a threat where you need to put up a wall and it translates it more into there's an opportunity here, there's a real issue, and I think we need to think conscientiously about how we can solve it, how we can look at it as an opportunity to make our product better and our customers happier. Yeah, it's much harder to ignore customers when you see them as real people and instead of just a list of complaints that you're getting sent to you from someone else. Right. Matt, we've discussed how Help Scout creates excellent experiences for your clients. These are the users of your tool like us, like Seller Smile. But we have a customer, so there's this next dimension of sort of this customer-user relationship. We talked a little bit about dog fooding already. I like that term. But in your opinion, how does Help Scout help companies create excellent experiences for their customers? So the shopper that is on the receiving end of our Help Scout message is totally unaware that they're being exposed to Help Scout. Regardless, we're still able to interact with them and and hopefully deliver an excellent experience. How is Help Scout able to do that in the best way in your mind? Yeah, so we are lucky. As I said, we're lucky that we we get to have that customer experience all the time. Like in a lot of places, you're selling something you don't necessarily use every day, but we do use Help Scout every day. So the whole platform is kind of embodied with this set of beliefs about what is good experience. So uh, you just said it, when you when you use Help Scout to talk to your customers, your customers never need to know that Help Scout even exists because they're not getting an email that has a 20 character long ID on the end of it that makes it look like you were trapped in a database. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's just, here is a, a reply from a person and they're answering my question. They don't need to track the ticket number. There's no portal that they have to log into. Just because as 
you know, the founders of the company, especially, and I've seen this too, you have bad experiences like that and you think, well, it doesn't have to be like this. And so the product is kind of built so that you, by default, you're not doing that to customers. You're replying and it's as close as we can get it to just a usual conversation. And we call them conversations in the application as well uh, to try and reinforce that idea. Like this is not a ticket. This is just a conversation and think about it that way. And you use Beacon as well, I think, at Seller Smile. So the way that Beacon is designed, it's a similar kind of philosophical approach in that we had bad experiences using other services where this thing pops up and says, oh, look, Bob is here to help you. And it turns out Bob is a lie. Bob is not there to help you. Bob was there five hours ago and he's not yeah. definitely not going to answer you now. He's not going to answer you until tomorrow, maybe. And so it just, it's just a bad experience. And so Beacon just doesn't do that. If the person is not there, they don't, you don't get shown a person, you get a different message that it says like, Hey, we get back to you. And we usually get back to you in the next, in, you know, an hour, three hours, whatever it is. And we're trying to help all our customers set those good expectations because that is a contributor to a good experience. So I think it's embedding a whole bunch of those sorts of things into the product. That's part of how we help our customers do a great job. And outside of the product itself, a lot of what I do and what my colleague Emily does on the blog side. So I do help you, which is this kind of educational resource for customer service. And the blog is educational resource uh, and kind of bigger picture stuff about how to run a customer focused business. So you can come to help scout, even if you never use the products and you can learn like, how do I write a good apology or how do I hire a really good support person? Or how would I build a marketing strategy that's customer centric or a remote first company, all of this practical advice and big picture kind of information that you can just take and learn from and take the bits that make sense to you. Even if you never pay for a help scout service at all, although please do, of course. Of course. And just, uh, I just kind of wanted to pipe in and say, Matt touched on this earlier where there's a lot of terminology that gets tossed around like the customer experience and it can make that phrase kind of feel a little bit cheapened. But what I love about Help Scout's blog and some of the webinars that I've seen is that you guys are truly digging into some of the real meat underneath. Some of the things that, you know, aren't as easy to understand. I was just watching one where Matt, where you, where you were on and you guys were talking about how to truly understand what your customers are saying. Like there was an example on the screen of a, of a customer's email and understanding the underlying thing that that person's actually asking. So things like that, I, I'm a huge fan and definitely recommend to our listeners. I wanted to highlight, Matt, what you talked about, even the simple idea of shifting the attention from a ticket to a conversation. Michael, you've caught me on that before too. When we're working on notes together, I might be writing or using the word ticket. You preferred, I think it was interaction, but the sentiment was the same. It was like, we're trying to think about this as a really meaningful person to person conversation. If using a simple word such as ticket sort of takes that human element out of it, it's less tangible, it's more inanimate. And I don't think that's a good way to go. The right way to go is towards a more human centered approach, at least that's the experience that we have. And I can feel Help Scout would agree with that. Offline, I'm always correcting Ty from using the word tickets. I, I'm not a fan of that. I used to have a, a manager in one of my first managerial customer service positions where they would say, how many tickets did we get done? And it's like, I, I want to talk to you about some of the actual good stuff happening. And, and you know, the, the focus was too shifted on that wall that we were talking about earlier. Thank you so much, Matt, for covering that. The final aspect of this conversation, I'd like to have your opinion on what it's like to work for Help Scout to be part of their team, because there's this sentiment, this idea in customer experience that it sort of has to be through and through. It's really difficult to offer authentic customer service and, and, and really great customer experience if it's unpleasant to work for that company. The best experiences a team can deliver are sort of powered by the fact that they feel maybe valued and appreciated with the team that they're working with. So tell us a little bit about the experience about being a part of that team, how that relates to the ability to give a great experience to the customers that you work with. Yeah, it absolutely does. Certainly I have had in my past worked in places where you feel less valued as a person and it's very hard, especially in a customer facing role, it's very hard to care about customers and to put effort in for customers if you feel like nobody cares about the job you're doing anyway. But at Help Scout, I'd say there are a few things that really matter, at least to me, in my experience working here. It's been about three years, a little over three years. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Help Scout puts a ton of effort into the employee experience as a whole. But I would say the first thing for me is like that remote first aspect at Campaign Monitor, I was in the office in Sydney and I had a mostly remote team and I made plenty of bad decisions in the early days there, just not understanding what it's like to be a person who is not, uh, you know, in the office when there is an office. Uh, Help Scout, on the other hand, is remote first. There, there is an office. It's only got a few people in it in Boston, but everybody else is all around the world. And and I'm a remote person and not in the Sometimes in the tech world, being a remote person means like, oh, I don't live in San Francisco. I live in like Sacramento. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. But I'm in Australia and the rest of my team is on the other side of the planet. And that is really remote in time and space. So that makes a huge difference. The fact that the meetings are kind of scheduled with my team to fit me and, and when, it, when I can make it to them. And I can be flexible too, but they're recorded for me as well. If I can't make it, it's all recorded. And when I get up in the morning, it's done. It's there. I can watch it right now. I don't have to wait three days like it used to happen in some places I've been. Uh, decisions are recorded in Asana or in the wiki or on Slack or something where I can actually read it later. I can still contribute to the discussion. So, well, that's really critical to not being disadvantaged by being down here on the kind of butt end of the world. <laughs> and then we get together twice a year in person for these whole company retreats. That makes a huge difference. One of my experiences where I really learned this in my last job again was being, because we used to do company retreats at Campaign Monitor too, and I would meet my whole team because they were mostly remote and they would, half of them had never met the other half, right? So they would um, talk for the first time, maybe after being there for a year, and I just had a person come up to me saying, you know what? I used to think that this guy was a real pain until I actually talked to him in person. And now I'm That's reinterpreting great. all of that text conversation we were having. I'm just reading it differently now because I know who this person is. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. So remote, that's the big one. And the second big thing I think about Help Scout is they're really, really deliberate about diversity and inclusion, which again, in the tech world, not always the case. You know, if you need the evidence, like there's plenty of evidence that having a more diverse and a more inclusive team is good for business. But just for me, selfishly, like I've been in the tech industry for a long time and uh, as a straight white man, huge surprise to everyone listening, I'm sure. Um, look, I'm just really glad to work at a place where it's just not, it's me and 25 other people who are either called Matt or David, which is just how it feels like sometimes. <laughs> It's just, there's just a much broader set of people to listen to and learn from their experiences. And it just makes my life much nicer to have that kind of more interesting, uh, diverse team. So I love In it. My experience, that perspective too is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have learned just so much about, you know, even things when I, the way that I would respond to something is going to be very different than the way someone else is going to respond to something who's come from a different set of life background. Uh, and sometimes they can see things in the, even in customer messages, people can see things that I would not see just because I don't have the, the context to understand what it's about. So I think it's really valuable. Um, and helps get in general, they just put a ton of effort into building a place where the people I work with are all people who want to do a good job, uh, and who care about the work that they're doing. And that just makes life much nicer. Thank you, Matt. We have a few minutes here. I'd like to wrap up with one final question, and then we'll tell listeners how to get in contact with you and, and help Scott if they'd like to learn more. Final question is, we're talking a lot about around the human element of customer service and what it means for the customer experience as a whole. We know that human experiences and emotions are very powerful. They influence behavior, how we act, how we shop. In your experience, working remote, working with a support team, how have you seen it work best in terms of incorporating that human emotional element in a virtual setting when you're not in the same room, shaking hands, looking in that other person's eyes? How do you adjust for that when that type of situation is impossible to have? One of the things I used to find most frustrating as a, like a support person was when you get a comment, like you send this answer and you get a reply like, I want to talk to a real person. Uh, and I, like my immediate reaction, it was like, but I am a real person. But I think over time I started to understand like what's actually going on here is like for these people and for most of us, the average quality of service that we get like in every area, the customer experience you get in every area of life is so bad most of the time, especially online, is that just people have expectations that it's just going to sort of suck. And so they come in with that attitude of like, I'm going to get treated badly. I'm not going to get what I want. I have to be real 
upfront and aggressive about it. And so they're trying to like skip all of that. They're trying to say, I want to talk to a real person. I don't want to get your auto response and your canned message that's not relevant to me. They're reaching out for that human contact and and it's hard to do. But one of the things like as a small company, if you're like an e-commerce seller and you've got a small organization, the first thing to do is not try to pretend that you're huge. Right? And it's kind of tempting because it's really easy online to have a nice web design, a nice template that makes it look like your um, huge company. But you just, you do that, you're giving away this advantage that you have over the big companies. Like you're an individual person, you're a small team, you've got personality, you've got some ideas, and you can use that in your marketing and in your writing and in your support, your social media. You can just let some of that out and make it much more apparent. Like I am a real person. I'm trying to connect with you as a person. You've got this problem. I'm trying to help you or you're trying to get this thing done. You want to buy something that we have. You can use that. Matt, I wanted to riff on something you just mentioned, which is like being a real person. Something that we tend to recommend to e-commerce sellers, because a majority of the time it ends up being just like them running their business is in their customer service replies, especially when someone's upset, it's always good to take the time and introduce yourself and say, Hey, my name is Michael Melgar. I'm the founder of Seller Smile. We're so sorry to hear this happen to you. You know, we really care about your experience and add that personal touch where, I don't know, to me, it makes me feel much more cared about that the owner of this company is actually responding to my message. Yeah, exactly. Right. You're just connecting with them and saying, you are important to me. I'm not a massive organization that literally doesn't care about you. Like I actually do care because this is my company or I'm a, one of a few people in this business. And so every customer is really important and you can make that very clear. I wanted to highlight what you said about don't pretend to be huge. Michael and I felt that urge and I still do with our own company because uh, large companies are the ones that that's proof that they've been successful and they're growing and they have a product that everyone wants. If you're small, it's almost like, well, what's what's wrong with your company? You know, you should be bigger if, if you're successful. But I completely agree. It's an advantage. I think companies that are small can use more because now we're not dealing with a monolithic entity that has no personality and it doesn't really have a strong personal mission that I can resonate with as a customer or as a supporter. So I really enjoy that you said that there. Uh, so I think there's another element maybe that sometimes in big companies do this too. You get a lot of like formality in the interactions. And some of that formality comes from, you know, there are policies, there are pre-written answers that they have to use. And uh, and sometimes it comes from, in support especially, I think it comes from people who are just giving an answer that they've been told is the correct answer and they don't actually understand why. Like, why is our shipping policy the way that it is? Uh, whereas, again, in a small company, you know why the policies are the way the policies are and you can be human and you can explain that to the customer in a way that they're going to understand. So I used to tell my team, think about if your friend came to you and asked you a question about this product or this this thing, like, should I buy this? Is it going to be good for me? You would answer differently than you would answer to someone you don't know. But you can bring some elements of that back into every conversation. And you can kind of say, hey, tell me a bit about yourself. Like, what are you trying to do? Is this going to be good for you? Well, tell me. How are you going to use it? What do you think it's going to do for you? And you can have a bit more of a conversation with them and a little bit of fun sometimes if they're a person who's a bit of fun. Not everyone is. So share a little bit about yourself. Say sorry when, when you're actually sorry, like a person, and don't talk like a robot lawyer, that sort of thing. Don't talk like a robot lawyer. I like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think injecting that nuance into the response makes all the difference because that is the difference between robots and humans. We can interpret things. We can read between the lines. We can see what's actually happening. Matt, I wanted to end the call here by you telling us what's the best way to get in contact with you or Help Scout. Uh, I've really enjoyed the conversation today. Hopefully we can do it again soon, but we want to be respectful of your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, so if you want to talk to me specifically, Twitter is probably the easiest way if you're into Twitter, at uh, Mr. Pato, M-R-P-A-T-T-O. If you want to learn about Help Scout, the product, the quick way to do that is go to helpscout.com slash classes. We have really regular live classes there. You can get a full overview of how the product all work uh, and then you can ask questions and get your questions answered really quickly. Some of the educational stuff, the stuff that I do is at helpscout.com slash help you, the letter U. All the kinds of articles, great playlists there, including some stuff specific to e-commerce sellers. 
And guys, I can't recommend some of that information enough. I myself am following Matt and, and some of the content that the Help Scout team creates. Matt, thank you guys so much for the work that you guys are putting into Help Scout and the information you're putting out. You guys are helping make the e-commerce customer experience world better. And uh, we appreciate what you do. Thanks for being on. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much for having me. If you're looking for a customer service help desk solution and you're interested in trying Help Scout, we have an exclusive offer for our listeners. Sign up for a free Help Scout trial through our special link and receive a complimentary $50 credit. Just go to sellersmile.com forward slash help scout and you'll automatically receive the credit when you sign up. If you're curious about the customer experience of a particular company, one that you'd like to learn more about, send your request to keepsmiling at sellersmile.com and we might feature them on a future episode. To find the show notes, which includes links to the resources and articles we discussed, go to sellersmile.com forward slash zero one five. If you found this conversation valuable, please subscribe and you'll get the next conversation straight to your device. Thanks again and keep smiling. Oh, 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 oh,